Honourable Member for Parkdale, High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm very pleased to be able to participate in the, uh, in the debate today. I'm, I'm uh, requesting to share my time with the member from Gatineau. And um, I would like to thank my colleague uh, from Victoria, my NDP colleague from Victoria, for submitting uh, uh, this uh, motion and for his tremendous work on the issue of pensions, which affects so many Canadians. And I'd like to, just for the benefit of, uh, of those here participating in the debate and Canadians who are, who are watching the debate, read the actual motion so that we're clear what it is we're discussing. And the motion reads that this House call on the government to commit to supporting an immediate phase-in of increases to basic public pensions benefits under the Canada and Quebec pension plans at the upcoming meeting of federal, provincial, and territorial finance ministers this month at Meech Lake. Now, it doesn't specify exactly what form these increases would take or the rate of increase, but it does say that this is something that the ministers should take the opportunity to address uh, without delay at the meeting in uh, Meech Lake. And it is because, as many are now recognizing, Canada is facing a retirement security crisis. Uh, nearly a third of Canadians face a drop of more than 20 percent in their standard of living by the time they face retirement. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I see this frequently in my riding in Parkdale High Park. I have constituents who come in and they say they had no idea how financially strapped they would be when they retired. They, they kind of expected there would be enough uh, through the Canada and Quebec Pension Plan to support them in their retirement years. And let's be very clear, the Canada and Quebec uh, Fund is absolutely rock solid. And this is a program that is the best pension, the most solid pension base that Canadians could ever want. It is indexed to inflation, it is portable, no matter where you work, when, no matter where you go in the country, you have access to the same benefits. It is, um, it is a rock solid investment that Canadians can be confident in for many, many decades to come. The major problem, Mr. Speaker, is that the benefits that it is currently paying out are not sufficient to be able to guarantee retirement security for Canadians. And the problem is, um, and the reason so many Canadians are facing a steep decline in the retirement income is that the vast majority of Canadians, they don't have a private pension plan. They don't have a company pension plan. They don't have an employer pension plan. They don't have... Uh, uh, RRSPs, if they did have RRSPs, often they'd become unemployed, they had to take the money out, uh, they don't have other investments. So the reality is most Canadians rely on the Canada and Quebec pension plan and the problem is uh, that it doesn't replace enough of their pre-retirement income and that is why uh, so many uh, agree that there is a retirement security crisis that is looming uh, in this country. Now, last year, the finance minister agreed with this assessment, and he agreed to move forward to increase CPP and QPP benefits. And now he doesn't seem to even want to meet with the provincial uh, representatives, the provincial finance ministers, because he's been ducking and diving on this issue. And so we want to encourage him to address uh, this uh, to address this issue. Now, we know that our colleagues in the Liberal Party have proposed a voluntary plan. We believe that what Canadians need is a mandatory plan that, uh, that will guarantee their retirement income, and that's uh, what we're proposing. And, and what we're proposing is completely affordable. Let me just share with, uh, with my colleagues here some uh, costing that uh, my colleague from Victoria has done. And, you know, there's, there's a variety of ways to increase the CPP. One is uh, the plan proposed by the Canadian Labour Congress, which would lead to uh, a, a doubling of benefits. But this is, uh, uh, even that would amount to the cost of about $4 a week, the cost of a couple of cups of coffee 
a week. That would be the cost to double the retirement benefits for Canadians. But there are other proposals that are out there. Uh, PEI has a proposal that would cost less than $2 a week. Less than $2 a week. And what would that mean for Canadians? That would see an additional uh, pension benefits for Canadians of $3,000 each year. That sounds like a pretty darn good deal. I don't think there's any investment that Canadians will find that will give them that kind of return with the security, the surety of the Canada Pension Plan. Now, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's not just uh, New Democrats that are saying this makes sense. Uh, as we've heard, the editorial today in the Globe and Mail, not exactly a radical leftist newspaper, I'm told. Uh, let me quote from the Globe and Mail. It says, expanding CPP should be done, and it should be done soon. Conservatives of the large and small C variety have long been uncomfortable with a bigger national pension plan. It sounds like a tax increase, but it's not. It's a savings plan, and it's the best one we've got. I wholeheartedly agree, Mr. Speaker. So let's, um, let's look at some others. We have an expert here, uh, an expert on payroll taxes, Rhys Kesselman, the Canada Research Chair in Public Finance at the School of Public Policy at Simon Fraser University. And, and here's what he has to say. Since the proposed CPP premium hikes would provide workers with correspondingly higher benefits in retirement, they are not like an ordinary payroll tax increase. Rather, they are like an individual's payment for improved insurance coverage. That's what it is, retirement insurance. He goes on, this premium benefit linkage means that CPP premiums lack the disincentive effects of most taxes. In other words, it's not a negative. He's saying it's a positive. He goes on. Concern over the effects of CPP premium hikes is unwarranted and should not be allowed to block this important policy reform any longer. We wholeheartedly agree, Mr. Speaker. So let's, let's hear what the OECD pension team has to say about Canada's pension plan. And uh, Edward Whitehouse, the leader of the OECD pension team, says... Uh, the analysis suggests that Canada does not face major challenges of financial sustainability with its public pension schemes. Long-term projections show that public retirement income uh, provision is financially sustainable. That's what we said earlier, Mr. Speaker. Our, pension plan is, our public pension plan is sound. They go on. Long-term projections show that public retirement income provision is financially sustainable. Population aging will naturally increase public pension spending, but the rate of, rate of growth is lower, and the starting point will be better than many OECD countries. Moreover, the earnings-related public schemes have built up substantial reserves to meet these future liabilities. Um, so they're convinced that the, we have the capacity uh, with our current plan, uh, but they also say... Um, they also say, on the other hand, Canada is different because unlike most other countries, our public pension commitments are not a substantial threat to our public finances. The Canada Pension Plan is in long-run balance. Old age security takes only 2.41% of GDP. Very few OECD countries have lower levels of public pension spending as a share of GDP than Canada. To take the extreme example, Italy spends more than 14% on on, of GDP on public pensions, up 10% from only a few years ago. We're at 2.41% of GDP, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have the support for this initiative. As I said, the Globe and Mail, uh, uh, tax experts, the Canadian Association of Retired Persons, who just wants to get on with this, even the CIBC economics report said that the CPP uh, is a good plan. The CPP has the scale to make big investments and get better returns with relatively low cost. Mr. Speaker, Canadians rely on the Canada and Quebec pension plan. We have to make it better, stronger, so it covers more of their post-retirement income. We can do it. Let's get together in this House, address this crisis now. Let's make it happen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Questions and comments? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I listened with great interest to my friend from Parkdale High Park. I represent a constituency, Ottawa West of Peen, which I think has one of the five or six highest percentages of seniors. There are a good number of elderly women, many of which who don't have a defined benefit pension and rely on a public system. Uh, so this is something, an issue that I follow very closely. Obviously, uh, you could say there is a certain attractiveness uh, to, um, to expanding the Canada Pension Plan. But I say to the, the member opposite, it always comes down to this. How do you pay for it? Can Canadian employers afford to take a not insignificant increase in payroll taxes? And we know from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business that payroll taxes are the toughest uh, on, uh, on employers and on uh, creating new jobs for uh, small businesses and medium-sized enterprises particularly. But what do you say to the average Canadian worker, someone who's middle class, maybe making uh, $35,000 a year, $40,000 a year, struggling to make ends meet? Their hydro bills are going up. Uh, they're in the province of Ontario, particularly our province. Uh, they're facing uh, a, tough, uh, a tough go. They don't all of, our, all of Canadians, all Ontarians, don't have the money to pay these increased uh, payroll taxes that they'll be required to pay. And it's not an issue whether it's a payroll tax or a contribution. They don't have any cash in their pockets to put out, many of the people I represent. And so while I, the idea has certain attractive elements to it, does she not concede that there are far, far too many Canadians who simply don't have the money in their pockets to be able to make increased contributions because they're having a tough buy making ends meet today? member for Parkdale High Park. Well, I thank my colleague opposite for his, uh, for his thoughtful question, um, but I ask him to consider the uh, proposition of paying the cost of a cup of coffee and getting an extra $3,000 a year in pension benefits increases. That sounds like a pretty darn good deal. The cost of a cup of coffee, the cost of $2 the cost of a cup of coffee. And the, the solution to someone who is cash strapped today is not to have them fall into even greater poverty tomorrow. And for, and for, my, friends, and for my friends in small businesses, you know, I, I come from a riding that is, is full of remarkable small businesses. And I know how tough it is. I know for those small businesses that are getting gouged by credit card fees, in their stores, they, they are being, they, they operate close to the wire. But I say to them, the best thing for small business is retirees with cash in their pockets. Isn't that what small businesses want? They want customers with money. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Markham Unionville. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd just like to clarify one point. I think the Honourable Member referred to us as, in some sense, substituting a voluntary CPP for uh, the real one. I would remind her that it was the Liberal government under Lester Pearson that brought the CPP in in the first place. It was Paul Martin that fixed it and made it sustainable. So we are more committed, or at least as committed as any other party, to the long-run sustainability of the existing Canada Pension Plan, and we are open to moderate increases in the size of it over time. The supplemental Canada Pension Plan, we want to consider that as an addition, not as an alternative. And I made reference to the British experience where because they have auto-enrollment, even though it's voluntary, over 90% of the employees decide to stay in it. So it's voluntary, but 90% of the people elect to stay in it. So I would ask if the Honourable Member understands, A, the long-term commitment of the Liberal Party, the definitive commitment to the existing CPP, and the point that our supplemental CPP, while voluntary, is set up in such a way that many people will choose to participate. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Parkdale High Park. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, I welcome my colleague's support for our motion, if that's what I take his comments to be. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's wonderful news, because uh, they had been advancing a, a voluntary proposal, and uh, you know, I think it, it can kind of muddy the debate when you're saying, well, we like a little bit of this, we like a little bit of that. I think that we have an opportunity now to improve the Canada and Quebec pension plan. 
once and for all, let's get this on track so that Canadians can have security when they go into retirement and we don't have a, a, a financial crisis for about a third of Canadians. We don't want to see that. Um, and uh, if the Honourable Member is saying that he supports the NDP proposal, we're quite happy to, uh, to accept that support. I then reach across the aisle and offer uh, to my colleagues uh, on the government side with their support. I think that would give the added confidence and encouragement to the Finance Minister when he meets the Provincial and Territorial Ministers in Meech Lake uh, later this month. Thank you.